Welcome. Today we'll be taking a look at the notes worksheet entitled Finding Models for Sinusoidal Graphs and Data Day 2. This lesson offers us a perfect opportunity to review some of the concepts from sinusoidal functions and also expand on one or two characteristics that we've only touched on so far. So why don't we go ahead and start with a nice application example that you see at the top of your page and then see where the lesson leads from there. All right, so example one reads, at the Boulder County Fair, my kids, Leah and Reed, boarded a Ferris wheel from a platform that was eight feet above ground, and that would be the lowest point. The Ferris wheel had a diameter of 44 feet and made a revolution every 27 seconds. So parts A and B represent kind of the preliminary stage and then really the, the nuts and bolts of it, being able to write a sinusoidal function for, um, for the problem. So even before we graph, I, I don't know, this is sometimes what I do is just get a picture of what's going on. So here's my Ferris wheel right here. Platform um, is from here to here, and so the kids get on right there and go around, and that platform is eight feet above the ground. Now we do want to be a little careful, especially when we hit the graph. The diameter of the wheel, so that would be top to bottom there, would be the 44. Don't know if that's helpful but um, just it gives me a, a good visual before I go ahead and try to graph this. So why don't we go ahead and get a coordinate plane going. I think we can just focus on the first quadrant and not worry about quadrants two, three, and four as we're not really dealing with any negatives here. And let's get our two axes labeled as well. This is going to certainly be a function where the height depends on time. So time is our independent variable, and the height in terms of time will be our dependent variable, something like that. And then let's try to get a good scale going. It doesn't have to be perfect by any means. We just have to get the basics in play, and then that should allow us to write this function. So I saw from the problem, kids get on eight feet above, and that would be the lowest point. And so it's just going to be going up and down from there. And this is the one we just have to be a little careful of. The only mistake that I can see on the graph would potentially come from this piece right here. We don't want to put a 44. And I hope you saw that as well. And to be honest, that's the whole reason for me doing this piece. Because if they are at the top of the wheel, they are 8 feet plus the 44 feet above ground. And so I'm seeing this as 52, everybody. Okay, perfect. So the heights are going to fluctuate in between the 8 and the 52. And let's get at least one time component on there. I think that's all we need. Uh, 27 seconds for the period, and so one cycle will take that 27 seconds. All right, sounds good. Let's get the sinusoidal wave going in this graph. Uh, they get on at the bottom, so right here when time is zero, and then up halfway, and then after 27 seconds, right back where they started. Now hopefully, that gives us at least our ammunition to start getting some of the characteristics taken care of and being able to write our function. So I'll get a couple of the ideas going. I want you to think of these as I'm writing them. We certainly need the midline. We definitely need the amplitude. We'll need the period, although that was pretty much given in the problem. And then we will have to ask ourselves sine, cosine, or flipped cosine for this one um, based on the way we, we drew it. All right, so midline first, everybody. You could probably kind of ballpark it just looking at these numbers. They're pretty straightforward. But just in case you forgot, I'll be a little more formal with this. Remember the midline is the maximum plus the minimum and divide by 2. So don't forget that piece. The middle is really just the average of the two. And so in this case, I've got 52 plus 8, which would be the 60. 60 divided by 2 is 30. So the midline would be y equals 30. I guess the dependent variable here is, is the height. So h of t equals 30, not that it matters a ton. The 30 is what we're going to be after, obviously, when we write our function. Okay, now once that 30 is in play, and by the way, I might throw that in right here just for a visual aspects, um, what's the amplitude? So again, visually, I think we would just kind of count it from that midline to the maximum. We could probably figure out what that is. But just in case, if not, remember mathematically, amplitude is just the maximum minus the minimum over 2. Good little review of those concepts. And in this case, 52 minus 8 is 44, and 44 divided by 2 is going to be 22. And I have a feeling that's what you were counting 
from that midline to max anyway, but amplitude equals 22. Perfect. No need to dwell on this one too long. Um, one revolution every 27 seconds, so that is the time it takes for a full cycle in our sinusoidal wave, so period is 27. Only, only piece remaining, I should say, is sine, cosine, or flipped cosine, and I am truly hoping that you see this as starting at the minimum, and whenever we start at the minimum, we call it, and this, put it in quotes just because it's sort of my way of describing it, sort of a flipped cosine. All right, we're ready. Let's go write our function. So height in terms of time, everybody. I'll use my function notation there. And because we're using flipped cosine, our A value won't be positive 22, but instead negative 22. So throw that into the mix, if you would, along with our cosine. So there's the flipped cosine taken care of, the negative with that cosine, amplitude being 22. Awesome. Now we will have our B value, which will be, remember, 2 pi over the period, so 2 pi over 27 times our independent variable. No phase shift necessary, of course, because we chose the flipped cosine approach. And then just throw that midline value on the back, and that looks absolutely outstanding. Now I know we did it right, but just always good, if you're ever unsure about creating a function to match a particular graph, easiest thing to do is just go right to the graphing calculator and check it out. So I'm going to do that real quick. Hopefully we won't waste too much of our time on this piece. You can just take a peek up here and I'll change my window and everything for us just to see it. So I'm going to go to window and uh, let's see, let's go 0 to 27 on our x value. So this piece right here is 0 to 27. I'm going to run the y's. How about just 0 to that 52? And I'm going to hit graph, and hopefully we'll see exactly what uh, was over here. Certainly the calculator did a much job than my freehand drawing, but you get the idea no matter what. All right, that looks quite nice. Let's go utilize it. So C and D would be the next two approaches. One, I give you the input, you give me the output. The other one, reverses. I give you the output, and you give me the input. So let's go get them. Let us see. Not too bad at all. Determine the height for Leah and Reed one minute after boarding the Ferris wheel. Just remember, everybody, we are in seconds. So in this case, one minute really is the height after 60 seconds. And it's nice. Anytime you have the input and you're trying to get the output, honestly, there's very little work that goes into it. Just make sure everything is oriented properly. But ultimately, the calculator is just going to do all those calculations that you see. And so I'm going to bring up the calculator and do exactly that as well. So right to the main screen, everybody. Let's just do it. Make sure you are in radian mode, by the way. If you haven't checked, just hit mode. I know I'm ready to go. So cosine and then 2 pi divided by 27. Let's multiply by our input here, which is 60. Close that off and add the 30, and that looks outstanding. Any input should be able to produce an output with this. So what it's basically saying is if my kids kept going on this, which they probably did a few times around, I think I saw 26.18 feet. How nice. All right, any input, come up with the output. All right, the better math, in my humble opinion, comes from letter D. Now, I give you the output, you come up with the input. So in this case, it says, determine the first time, in this case, uh, the number of seconds, for Leah and Reed to reach a height of 30 feet. So output is 30, everybody. Let's throw that into the mix. 30 equals. And in the rest of our model, leaving T as something to solve for. So 2 pi over 27 times the t, and add that 30 on the back. All right. So I see this as just good algebra, undoing some of the operations that will allow us to get the variable by itself. We always work from the outside in, so I think we're going to probably have to undo the plus 30. 
probably have to undo the multiplication of negative 22, have to undo the cosine ratio right here, and then undo finally the 2 pi over 27 times that our independent variable. So let's go ahead and do it. Everybody, as quick as can be, let's subtract 30 on both sides. 30 minus 30 gives us 0. So 0 equals, and just keep writing it. Make sure everything is super organized there so you don't lose track of anything. What do you say that next step is uh, divide by negative 22? And the nice thing here, just numerically, 0 divided by negative 22 still stays 0. Okay, good. 2 down, 2 to go. This is probably for us the most integral step to this entire equation solving process. We have to undo the cosine ratio. And just like we did on the previous two steps, we want to apply the opposite operation. So the opposite operation of taking the cosine ratio would be taking the inverse cosine. And so I'm going to take the inverse cosine on the right-hand side. That will get rid of this. And then obviously I'll have to take the inverse cosine on the left. So inverse cosine of 0. All right, I'm going to have to come over here. But let's bring that calculator up. And let's type in inverse cosine of 0. All right, and the inverse cosine of 0 as a decimal, I'm going to round to uh, a few decimal places there. Looks like I get 1.5708. By the way, the inverse cosine of 0 is a number that we know pretty well. This actually happens to be a number that we've explored quite a bit over the semester. But for right now, we don't have to worry about that. Let's just get that decimal going. And then we undid the cosine on the right, and that's looking great. Last step, if you have already expressed this as a decimal, you can probably just go ahead and divide it on over to the other side there and have your t in play. I'm going to go ahead and take this as multiplying by 27 and then dividing by the 2 pi to undo those two operations. So I'll go ahead and do that. So times 27, divide. And if you are doing the division of 2 pi exactly like I'm doing, just make sure you put that 2 pi in parentheses. We've seen that so many times so far this semester. And that looks good. I have a t value ready to roll. So 6.75 seconds, that's t. Awesome. Interestingly enough, did you happen to notice this particular value? 6.75 happens to be exactly a quarter of uh, 27. And that makes perfect sense here because if you remember the problem, 30 feet, how long it takes to hit 30 feet, well, if they're going this way at the bottom, they hit that midline at exactly a quarter of the way around. So 30 feet is the midline, took 6.75 seconds to reach it, another 6.75 seconds to reach the top, another 6.75 to hit the other part of the midline, and then another. 6.75 to get back to the bottom. So the fact that this is a quarter of the way around, or a quarter of the time it takes to go all the way around, I should say, should be um, exactly what we expect. If you notice that actually right away, probably saved yourself a little time and energy, but um, still pretty good. Good math. All right. Hey, let's move forward. Example two, everybody. Do you have to be able to put data in a calculator and be able to come up with a model. So this is a good one right here to sort of test that idea. Example two, the following table represents the sunrise times in Boulder, Colorado. The middle two times have been changed from daylight savings to standard time in order to keep everything uniform. And you see that right here. So we have those pieces ready to go. And we have the sunrise times as a function of the day of the year. I did have to add a, um, one more value. If I only added these four, the calculator actually would not have enough information to come up with a sinusoidal regression. So that is why you see this um, fifth data point right there. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get it. It says find a sinusoidal regression for the data. And so sunrise time in terms of the day of the year, that looks great. Y in terms of X. 
again, if um, you do know how to do this, that's great. Let's get a little more practice on it. If you don't know how to do it, really just make sure you're understanding it as we go through the process. Hey, everyone, go to your y equals for me, if you would. If you have anything in there, let's clear it out. And let's turn the stat plot on just for the time being. So just right there should do. Highlight it, and that looks great. Okay. Remember kind of the, the way we're going to set this up. It's three steps. Enter the data, view the data, and model the data. So enter means we hit stat and then edit. If you happen to have data in your L1 and L2 already, just go up to L1, hit clear, and enter. Go up to L2 and hit clear, and enter. Okay, so our L1 would be the independent variable, which would be the day of the year. So let's get those in play. I have my 80, 172, 264, 355, and last but not least, 445. Okay, move it on over, guys, and let's take care of the sunrise times. So it was easier for me to just go ahead and put it all in hours rather than having to do kind of the um, hours and minutes right there. So um, it's ready to go. Let's just put it in. Again, you could probably do this faster than I can. So you're more than welcome to fast forward if you've already entered it in. I'm a little slower up on the board here. And one more for me. Awesome. So data is entered, day of the year, sunrise times that correspond. I like viewing the data just personally, so I hit zoom at the top. And then number nine for the zoom stat. And you could see that nice sinusoidal um, set right there. That looks really good. And what we want to now do is, is set up a sinusoidal regression to match those five data points. So everybody hit stat, move it over to calc. You could probably just go up one, but it should be the one all the way at the bottom there. So let me get to it. There we go. So sinusoidal regression right there. Now on the TI-83, I do this, and then I like pasting it in personally. If you do happen to have a TI-84 and you're just not sure what to do on that particular screen um, after you've hit the sign reg button, just let me know. I'd be happy to help you with it. Pretty straightforward. But I like going ahead and pasting the Y1 into the Y1. That way we can see how sinusoidal it is. But uh, let's go ahead and get this model going. All right, so there we go. We have our A. It defaults on sign. We have our B value, our C value, and our D value. The only difference from the way that we've looked at it in the past and what the calculator does, they do a plus C. We've always defaulted on the minus C. But uh, no worries. We'll just plug it in as is, and let's go for it. So letter A, Y equals. I'm going to go to, uh, looks like three decimal places what I have on my paper. So there's our amplitude, sign. Here's our B value. Multiply that into the independent variable, which would be the day of the year. And then I see a plus 1.663. And close the parentheses and then end it with a 5 and 3 eighths. That looks excellent. So sunrise time, all the Ys, day of the year, all the Xs. Now it would be nice to go ahead and at least utilize this model to some degree. So let's go ahead and do B and C. Obviously the way I do it, because this is a recording, is going to be slightly different than what you do. But um, it looks like for me, today is November 14th, which I just looked up is day 318 of the year. Now again, for you, if you don't mind using this particular day, that would be great. Just remember 31 days in January, 28 days in February, et cetera, et cetera there. Just do a quick count if you don't mind and put the day of the year right there for me. All right. Well, hey look, the day of the year is the input. No big deal. Remember, given an input, coming up with the output should not scare us. So for me, using our regression here, is 1.380 sine 
0.017. Now I've got a value for the independent variable, which is 318 plus the 1.663. And let's add the 5 and the 3 eighths on the back. So that's it. I mean, that's really what it comes down to, just that piece. Sunrise time right there. Let's see what the calculator produces. Again, I'm asking you to hopefully do um, it for this particular day, the one that you're watching the video on. But, uh, you know, I'll leave it to your discretion. So 1.380, let's get this going, sine 0 0.017 times, and then 318 for my particular day of the year. I'm going to add that 1.663, close that off, and add the 5.888. Fantastic. And notice what I get right there. So sort of in between 6 o'clock and 7 o'clock, it's 6.864 hours essentially. I'm going to go ahead and put this back into minutes. And obviously if this is the number of hours, I'll probably go ahead and just multiply it by 60, and that will produce the number of minutes. So 0.864 times 60. So it looks like, give or take, we'll say 651. So for me, 651 a.m., of course, and this is what was projected. It just so happens before I recorded this uh, particular lesson, I uh, looked it up online, and it's pretty close, all things considered. Some of these models are a little more sinusoidal than others, but this one's not too bad at all. So you can see in terms of a, a projection or a prediction, um, really only a couple minutes off there. So again, this is what I looked up in the morning. Would love for you to do the same, actually uh, see how close yours is. All right, very cool. Hey, I'm just going to go to graph real quick. Let's take a look. And you can see we've got a nice sinusoidal wave matching. Again, is it perfect? No, not necessarily, but it's, it's pretty good, all things considered. Excellent. Hey, everyone, let's get into just the back side here where we add one more characteristic to building our models, and we'll leave it at that. Okay. So it says, let's add one more component to sinusoidal models, and that is, of course, the phase shift. Let's underline that piece. There are a couple of different ways to write a model, for examples 4 and 5 when we get to them. And this is, is totally true. If you would like to explore an alternative way, please don't hesitate to ask. So if you happen to see um, example 4 and example 5 maybe bear out in a slightly different way than I teach it, please ask, because there are a couple ways to do it. But in the meantime, let's take just a moment and do example 3. Just um, a quick one, and actually a review, nothing more than that. Determine which function will produce a horizontal shift to the left, and which one will produce a horizontal shift to the right. So if I started with y equals sine of x, kind of the parent function right there, which one would go to the right pi over 4, which one would go to the left pi over 4? And if you remember, subtracting pi over 4 from the input would actually move it to the right. Adding pi over 4 to the original input moves it to the left. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind as we're working on phase shifts here. I would get the graphing calculator and graph it, but I don't think it's worthy of our time. Just wanted to review that piece. But now let's go ahead and do example 4. So example 4 states, use the graph to answer the following questions and, of course, to write a sinusoidal model. So if you look at the graph that I gave you here, there is a fundamental difference between this one and all the others that we've seen so far. If I look at the y-intercept, which it seems to be right in here, it's tough to tell exactly what it is, but if you notice that y-intercept, is it on the maximum? No. Is it on the midline? No. Is it on the minimum? No. So it's not on one of those three key points that would allow us to write a function without using a phase shift. It's kind of somewhere in between, and by the way, the midline is right here, so it's somewhere in between the midline and the maximum. So unfortunately, um, we can't just ask ourselves, hey, is it sine or is it cosine or is it flipped cosine? Because it's not on one of those three key points. So 
There are a couple ways to do this, as I stated. I just go ahead and do this based on using sign as the default. So that's what you see in Part D right here. We're just going to use sign. Theoretically, I could use cosine, and this works out just as well. We've talked about it before. Sine and cosine are essentially interchangeable. But this is how I do it. So obviously, we do need something to work with. So determine the D value. Hey, I already said the midline seems to be right here at y equals negative 1. So our D value is going to be negative 1. Throw that in. Should be a no-brainer. Determine the A value. So amplitude seems to be from midline up to the maximum. If I counted out everybody, 1, 2 units. A value is going to be 2. Okay. Determine the B value. In this case, I gave you the period. So uh, it looks like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in terms of our tick marks there. So period happens to be exactly 2. And we, of course, know the B value is always for sinusoidal functions 2 pi over the period, 2 is cancel, and I get pi. So the B value is pi. All right, so if you look at our model, not too bad, right? I know what A is, I know what B is, I know what D is, but I don't have C. Now remember, when we talk phase shift, saying it's C is actually not entirely accurate. It's really C over B. So I have to be a little careful with that piece. But the way I'm going to play it out is starting to talk about the prospect of putting in A, B, and D and looking for an alternative. So this is what I mean by that, and let's get this going. So everyone, on your paper, Y equals A is 2. We are going to default with sine. Again, if you want to do cosine, it would work out just as well. The B value is pi. C is the unknown. And the D value looks to be negative 1. And at this stage, unfortunately, I have too many things missing, right? I have Y and X and C, too many letters in there. So the question is, do I have one more piece of info? And that's what it says on your paper. What else can we use to solve for C? I need this as a numerical value. What allows us to get it? Well, if you look at the problem, specifically the graph, I gave you a point. And obviously, if it is a point on the graph of the function, it, is, it will make the equation true. So we can use it in the equation. X is 1 third when Y is 1. And that's it, guys. If I put in the point, that will allow me to have just one missing component, obviously the one we need. So without any more issues here, let's go ahead and do it. So the 1 goes in for y. The 1 third goes in for x. And we solve for c. All right, we've done this before, so let's just make it happen here. A few steps to get that c by itself. Everybody add 1. I'm going to consolidate these two guys. Pi times 1 third is pi over 3, by the way. Looks great. All right. Let's keep working from the outside in. Everybody, divide by 2. Oop, there we go. Yep, that's looking nice. How do I undo sine? Well, again, let's apply the inverse, everybody. Inverse sine on both sides. That'll get rid of this. And then the inverse sine of 1. I'll bring up my calculator one more time here, of course. You do the same, everyone. Inverse sine of 1. This also happens to be exactly pi over 2, just FYI. But we're going to just use the decimal for the time being, which was that 1.5708 sine went away, and I've got pi over 3 minus C. Getting pretty close, everyone. It's up to you what you want to do to get the C by itself. I like, since, I, since we have a minus C, I like bringing that over to the other side. So then it becomes positive. And in the same breath, if it's okay with you, I'm going to bring that 1.57 and change over to the other side. And basically it would look like this. And we could probably get it exact if I treat this as pi over 2, which it is. But you know what? For our purposes, I'm not too concerned about it. So when we get C equals, let's figure out what C is equal to. Pi divided by 3 minus our answer. And that's what we get. So C is equal to negative 
0.5236. Are we ready to write our function now? Yeah. We have A, we have B, we just solved for C, we have D. Can we now write a function for all of the X's and Y's on this particular graph? No doubt. So, part E here, let's do it. Y equals 2 sine pi divided by, or sorry, pi times x, and it was, this would be minus c, so minus the negative, so that would be plus, just make sure you have that piece, just careful on the sign. Now, you could put the decimal in, you're more than welcome to, 100% credit, no worries whatsoever. It just so happens that um, this value happens to be exactly negative pi over 6, just FYI. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to go ahead and treat it as pi over 6 there. So that decimal that we got from the calculator just happens to be pi divided by 6. And then throw the midline on the back. And lo and behold, I, I think we have it. Again, we haven't been able to kind of write these using the phase shift. I'm going to bring this on over and let's see it match up. Take a breather for a sec. Let me do the work here. I'm going to get rid of this. And our, our answer, let's see, we have 2 sine pi times x, and then would we say plus pi divided by 6, how about subtract the 1, I'm going to zoom and then, um, well, yeah, let's just zoom trig that. And does it look pretty close there? Looks pretty good to me. Does it pass through this particular point right here? There's only one way to find out. Watch this, everybody. I'm going to hit second and trace, get to that calculate menu, and I'm going to use the value. And I hit value, and I say, all right, well, when x is one-third, what's y? And notice it puts us exactly on the point that was given. How cool. All right, so again, that's just the way I go through it. If you happen to see a slightly different approach using the concept of phase shift, more power to you. I'll be happy to look at it with you. Um, as long as you can get a model to match the graph, you're good to go. Hey, if you're okay with that first one, no real need to go on to the second one. It's just a redundancy. But I like going through it one more time. Always just reinforce it, especially since it's new. So one more time through, uh, let's go ahead and get it. So, obviously, again, I look at that y-intercept. That's the key. Is this on the maximum? No. Is that on the midline? No. Is it on the minimum? No. Because it's not on one of those key points, I'm afraid we cannot just do quick sine, cosine, flipped cosine with no phase shift. So we need a c-value here. Let's algebraically figure it out. Okay, so I have a D value looks to be right here. Midline looks to be 2. So let's get this moving along. You guys can do this pretty quickly, I think. So if the midline is 2, which is right here, amplitude would be 1, 2, 3. Amplitude's 3. Okay, period in this case. Let's just be a little careful on this piece. Um, I gave you, let's see, each horizontal tick mark is pi over 2. And so it looks like, I don't know how you want to do this, but essentially from here to here, I'm seeing basically two of these tick marks is the period. And so as a result, I'm getting a period of pi. So I'm going to actually write that in there. If you have a question on that piece, of course ask. But as a result, the B value would be 2 pi over pi. So 2 pi over the period, pi will cancel, B is 2. Okay, good. We're going to do the exact same thing. We have A. We have B. We have D. I also have, and here's the key, I have a point. I have an X and a Y. And if you look at the comprehensive sinusoidal model, all of that can be put in play to find the one component that's missing, the C. So I'm going to go through it algebraically one more time. As I said, if this helps you, Certainly, please, let's go through it together completely. If uh, you don't feel that it's, it's necessary, if you kind of got the idea on the previous one, so be it. 
well, I'm going to start putting my stuff in right away to save us a little time and energy. The 5 is the Y value. 3 is the A. I default on sine. If you really want to, you can do this with cosine. It works just as well. The B value is 2. The X to match up with that Y value was 5 pi over 8. There it is right there. Minus C, there's our unknown, add the 2. Okay, everyone, it's ready. Let's solve it up. Outside in, everybody subtract 2. 5 minus 2 gives us 3. And I'm going to actually consolidate again here. Just FYI, if I did 2 times 5 pi over 8, this would be 10 pi over 8, which reduces really nicely to 5 pi over 4. Okay, everybody, divide by 3. Okay, looking good. Two more big steps to go. Undo sign, everybody, by doing an inverse sign on both sides. That'll get rid of this. Inverse sign of 1. And as I've stated before, if you want to, you can just go ahead and think of this 1.5708, this number right here. This is exactly pi over 2, just FYI. If you want to use it, great. If not, you could go decimal on it. Just because I have a feeling most of you will want to go decimal on it, I'm going to go decimal that way. And then 5 pi over 4 minus C. Awesome. I'm going to bring that C on over. I don't like it being negative, so I'm going to bring that C on over and bring it on this side. And again, in the same breath, I'm going to take that and bring it on over to the other side. If that algebraic step scared you and you didn't like it, please ask about it. We can go through it in a little more detail. I would let the calculator get this piece right here. And again, if you want to just go decimal on the answer, that's totally fine. I'm going to tell you exactly what it is momentarily. But you would just do 5 pi over 4 minus the um, answer there, which was the pi over 2 essentially. And we get about 2.3562, give or take. So C is equal to 2.3562. It just so happens to be that this is exactly 3 pi over 4. Again, not that you would need to know that by any means, so don't stress about that piece. If you uh, have this decimal and you want to use it, more power to you. Okay, here we go. Let's write this model and be done. Y equals 3 sine 2x. And then in, in this case, you have a positive C value, so minus, and then what do we say? 3 pi over 4 is what I'll use. And how about a plus 2 for good measure? Wow, that really is stellar. Let's just verify. Last piece of the puzzle, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and hit Y equals. Let's get rid of that one. You can kick back and just take a peek. I've got 3 sine 2X minus 3 times pi. Oop. Let's do that one more time. 3 times pi divided by 4. Close it off. Add the 2 for good measure. I'm going to have to change my window just a little bit here to see it. I think it went up to 5. So I'm just going to do this really fast for us. Does it look like the graph that I uh, have over here? Absolutely. If I want to verify one more point, I can definitely do that. I go to value. Again, you don't need to worry about this, but it is a good way to check. When x is 5 pi over 8, notice what I get. I get that y value of 5, and it matched up beautifully. Cool. Cool. Well, again, just kind of another piece to the puzzle with sinusoidals. Hopefully it's all clicking for you. As always, just let me know if you have any questions.